Hello, and welcome to today's lecture. Today we're going to be discussing Chapter 9, which is Communicating with Romantic Partners. Now, as we know, communication is so critical and valuable in our lives, and research has shown that when there's a lack of communication or de significant decreased communication in a romantic relationship, it lowers the intimacy in the relationship. So learning how to improve your communication in your romantic relationships is going to help you with greater intimacy with your partner. So let's talk about the relational stages in a romantic relationship. Relationships go through stages where they progress through time in development and sometimes, unfortunately, decline. So let's talk about these stages, shall we? There are five stages of coming together, which is where you're building towards greater intimacy. The first is initiating. And in initiating, it's your first initial encounter with the person, which obviously is positive because then you move towards the second stage of building greater intimacy, which is experimenting. So experimenting is basically small talk with that person, asking them questions about themselves, where they grew up, etc. The third step in coming together is intensifying. And this is where you start to express feelings towards this person and it's reciprocated. The fourth step is integrating. And this is where you start to see yourselves as a social unit. You call yourselves a couple and you promote this publicly to others. And then the fifth step in coming together is bonding. And bonding is usually signified by a wedding or a commitment ceremony or something official that states that you're a couple and that you're intending to spend the rest of your lives together. Now, unfortunately, the next five steps we're going to discuss are the, the five stages of coming apart. And this sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't happen in relationships. But with the data showing that 50% of all marriages end in divorce, well, you can see that one out of every two couples will go through these five stages that I'm going to talk about. So the first step in creating greater distance is differentiating. So this shows a, a shift from how alike you are with your partner to how different you are from your partner. And this will, again, we went to the top of the mountain and now we're starting to go down the incline. The second stage in coming apart is circumscribing. So this is evidenced by lower communication with your partner and a decrease in the quantity and quality of communication that you have with your partner. The third step in coming apart is stagnating, which as the word would suggest, your relationship just starts to go stale. It, you start to behave in old familiar ways with no feeling and that's not good. The fourth step in coming apart is the avoiding stage, and that's where you start distancing yourself physically and emotionally from your partner. And then the final stage is called terminating, and terminating is the final stop. This is it, this is where you break up, this is where the divorce happens, and it's not pretty. And we've all been there, and we've all been on both sides of that coin, and it's part of life, unfortunately, but it's how you learn from it and, and move forward from it that really is important. So let's talk about communication and your, your romantic potential. So we talked about how important communication is in romantic relationships, but communication differs in each stage of a, of a relationship. It's not always going to be the same depending on where you are. And Partners can also shape relational trajectory. So what does that mean? Your partner or you may recognize the early signs of coming apart, and then you may work to reverse this. As I said earlier, relationships take work. It doesn't matter if it's a friendship, a family relationship, or a romantic relationship. They take work, they take time, and they take effort. So if you see yourself heading down that downward spiral, there is a way to reverse that. Also, relational development involves risk and vulnerability. It, it's all about taking chances and becoming more interdependent and learning how to self-disclose with your partner. Every relationship 
like I said, takes work and takes effort, but it takes an opening of your heart and it opens yourself up to being vulnerable and eventually to possibly being hurt. But without a, without a risk, there cannot be a reward. So remember that. So let's talk about gender and intimacy. <clears throat> so women and men share differently and they have different communication goals and they communicate differently. But women tend to share more through words while men tend to share more through their actions. So that has been proven through communication research. And as far as physical intimacy goes, women tend to regard sex as a way to express intimacy with their partner, while men tend to feel that sex creates intimacy. And this can often have a, a difficult effect because the women need to build up to that and men feel like if they have sex with their partner, it'll increase their intimacy. So there's, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum sometimes. As for same-sex couples, they often have similar shared experiences and communication styles and often face the same challenges that heterosexual couples do as well. So now let's talk about love language. And yes, there is such a thing as a love language. There are different, there are actually five different types of love languages. So as I go through them, think about what love language is important to you and what you choose to express your love for your partner. So the first is affirming words. And we all know the power of positive words towards people, whether they be compliments, statements that express your love or your caring or affection for that person. We all love to hear those things and, and it never gets old. The second love language is quality time. So spending time with your loved one, whether it's doing tasks with them, working in the garden, washing your car together, cooking together. These are things that are a part of a love language, believe it or not, as well as just talking, just laying on a blanket and spending time outside and looking at the sky and, and just talking and sharing feelings. That's a love language as well. The third love language is gifts. And let's face it, who does not like to receive gifts? Obviously on birthdays and holidays and anniversaries, Gifts are, are usually expected, but sometimes it's the unexpected gifts, you know, bringing flowers home to your boyfriend or girlfriend or showing up with their favorite Starbucks drink or chocolate or candy. That is always a, a nice surprise and well, you should try it sometime soon. Now, physical touch obviously is an, is a love language as well. And, and, when I talk about physical touch, I don't necessarily mean sex. I mean a hug, a kiss, holding hands with someone. We as humans need touch. We need touch for our, our emotional development. And so these little things mean absolutely so much. So you should try and do more of them because holding hands with someone is great and giving a hug is, is awesome. And the last love language I wanna talk about <clears throat> are acts of service. So when you're not feeling well, isn't it great when people do things for you, like bring you food or do your laundry or do your chores for you, right? So these are things that can show and express your love and appreciation for your partner. So think about something that you might be able to do for your partner, your boyfriend or girlfriend that would really mean a lot to them. Maybe it's something you dislike doing, uh, but, or excuse me, that they dislike doing, but if you were to do it for them, it would mean so, so much. So again, the five love languages I just discussed are affirming words, quality time, gifts, physical touch, and acts of service. So what is your love language? Now let's talk about dialectical perspectives. So relationships usually involve continual negotiation between these certain perspectives and I'm gonna discuss them in detail right now. The first one is openness and privacy. The second one is connection and autonomy. And the third one is predictability and novelty. So let me explain them in further detail. Openness and privacy are just what you think they are. Openness is 
sharing and just self-disclosure where on the opposite end of that spectrum, sometimes it's important to have some emotional space and some privacy from your partner. Not that you're trying to be secretive or hide things, but you don't have to be with your boyfriend or girlfriend all the time. You need space. So sometimes there's that, that tug of war between openness and privacy. The second one is connection and autonomy. So connection and autonomy is spending time together as a unit, as a couple, and autonomy, having some space, having some time to do something just for you, which I think is very important. So when couples break up, you might hear one of them say, well, we barely spent any time together. Well, that's someone who wanted more connection when their partner wanted more autonomy. Or you might hear, I needed freedom. I needed my space. So that person felt suffocated. They felt trapped. They felt like their partner always had to be with them 24 seven. So how do you find that balance? It's definitely a challenge and something that many couples face. The last dialectical perspective is predictability and novelty. So obviously predictability, knowing how your partner is gonna behave is important, stability is important. However, it can lead to boredom. It can lead to monotony. So again, Putting, finding some way to have some novelty, have some surprises, change some things up. That's a good thing. Adding some spice to your relationship and not doing the same thing over and over. So again, to recap those dialectical perspectives, we had the openness versus privacy, the connection and autonomy, and the predictability versus novelty. So now I'm going to discuss with you nine strategies for managing these dialectical, these dialectical problems, because we all have them and we all have been there. So how do we deal with this? Well, the first way you can deal with it is by denying it exists. I wouldn't suggest that. So that's by, that's by saying something such as everything's fine. And of course, you know, when a lady says that it's usually anything but fine. Sometimes we're disoriented. Sometimes we're overwhelmed or we feel helpless and unable to confront our problems. And sometimes we just stick our head in the sand. Well, guess what? The problems are still there. It's just like your laundry. If you don't do it, it's still there. The third way to deal with uh, dialectical conflict is selection. So sometimes one, either you or your partner will select one end of the spectrum and you'll ignore the other. So with openness and privacy, you're only consumed with the openness part and you don't think about the privacy or vice versa. And that can be dangerous. The next strategy is alternation. And as the word suggests, you go back and forth between each end of the spectrum. You bounce back and forth. And that's kind of odd as well, but it happens. The next strategy is polarization. And that's where you and your partner each take an opposite stance of the spectrum and that's where you stand. And that's dangerous because that's, for example, with the openness versus privacy, then the one person wants to fully share all the time and the other person wants to remain closed. That's not going to work very well. Segmentation is the next step and that's when you compartmentalize different areas of your relationship. And that can be also very difficult because you can go with a demand or withdraw aspect. And that would be very difficult when you demand that you get something or you withdraw a certain behavior. So again, how do you manage these tensions? Very, very challenging. You can also have moderation. You can also have some compromises. Maybe you can back off from expressing either end of those dialectical spectrums and then work on working towards meeting your partner in the middle, which is a form of compromise. You might also reframe your dialectical tension. So instead of calling it a challenge, you could call it an exciting opportunity to grow, right? It's all in your mindset. It's all on how you view something. And then lastly, you could re at re you could have reaffirmation, which is accepting and embracing the fact 
that your relationship will have challenges and you work with that. Because again, life isn't perfect and it's not easy and relationships take work. So understanding that your relationships will be challenged and embracing that will actually help you and your partner grow closer together. So now we're gonna talk about deception. We're gonna talk about lies because unfortunately they, they exist. They're out there in relationships and they're different types of lies that you tell and your partner may have told you. So let's talk about altruistic lies. So altruistic lies by the person who tells them, they, they treat them as even harmless and sometimes even helpful to the person they're lying to. So let me give you an example. You go to dinner at a friend's house and you don't really enjoy the food, you don't really like the food, but you still compliment your friend on her cooking because you don't wanna hurt her feelings. An evasion is what is also called as a gray lie. So what that means is that you're deliberately vague when you're speaking to someone. And this can be done by equivocation, which is giving a statement that is ambiguous and might have two plausible meanings, or by hinting. So hinting is just what you think it is. It's, it's beating around the bush, it's being it's not being direct it, without directly asking for what you want. You're hinting for what you want the person to do. And the final type of deception is a self-serving lie. And this is very dangerous because it manipulates the listener into acting or behaving in a certain way. So you can have an omission or a fabrication where you actually withhold information. So you might think, well, I didn't tell that person anything, but the act of withholding the information is lying. So again, it's just another form of lying. So we talked about the three different types of deception, altruistic lies, evasions, and self-serving lies. So now we're gonna talk about conflict. And unfortunately, conflict is a part of life, whether it's with your friends or your family or your romantic partners. So let's talk about ways that we express our conflict. So some of them are good and some of them are not so good. The first is non-assertiveness. And when you're non-assertive, you have the inability to express your feelings. So you will just say that nothing is wrong when indeed everything is wrong, but you don't want to deal with the problem. The next type the next way of expressing conflict is indirect communication. So this is a roundabout way of expressing your conflict without being hostile. So it's indirect, which is also very frustrating because then you really, then the person really isn't sure what you're getting at because you're not being direct. The third way is assertiveness. And this is what I would actually encourage you to do in managing your conflict. This is a way in which you express your thoughts and feelings in a way that does not attack the other person's dignity. It's okay to have a disagreement with someone. It's not okay if you attack them or you're aggressive with them. So now we're gonna talk about the last two ways that people manage conflict, which is either passive aggressive or direct aggressive, and both are equally dangerous. Passive aggressiveness is when you express your hostility in an ambiguous way. So an example of this would be pretending to agree with something or to not to do something in the future when you have absolutely no reason that you're actually going to do that. So you agree that you're never going to do that again, and then you go ahead and you do that again. So we all know what passive aggressive people are like, and they're very dangerous. And the last one is direct aggression. This is where people embrace confrontation and they directly attack a person's position or dignity. Very dangerous, very hurtful. So another, uh, another hurtful conflict pattern, and I wanna talk about these four areas that are very dangerous, are criticism, defensiveness, contempt and stonewalling. So the first is criticism, and that's when you're, you're outright accusatory to somebody, and it's, it's very, very hurtful. The second type is defensiveness, and, and this often happens when we feel we're being attacked. 
So we will protect our self-worth by counterattacking, which doesn't, you know, two wrongs don't make a right, but when we're attacked, that's what we tend to do. Also, contempt, that's the third one. That is when we express our approval and disdain towards a person. And then the last one is stonewalling, refusing to engage with someone, completely shutting down and, and shutting them out, which again is not going to help your problems. Now, I do want to talk about abuse and abusive relationships, and I do feel it's important that we discuss this because studies show that many people in the United States are currently in an abusive relationship, and it happens every day and more likely than you really want to know. So I want to give you three things that will help you if you are in fact in an abusive relationship. The first thing I wanna say though, is that there's no magic communication formula to prevent or stop the behavior of an abusive person, but there are steps that you can take to protect yourself. So I do wanna share these with you just quickly. The first is to not keep it a secret. If you are being abused in any way, emotionally or physically or mentally, share it with someone, confide in someone that you can trust. Do not keep this a secret. Also, have a plan for your defense. Have emergency numbers plugged into your phone. Have a code word that you establish with your friends so that when you say this code word, they know you're in trouble. And avoid sharing passwords or personal information with your partner so that they can have access to your social media or to your email in which you might be using to reach out to people for help. And then the final thing I want you to understand in a, an abusive relationship, do not blame yourself. It is not your fault and nobody deserves to be treated in a disrespectful and abusive manner and you deserve better. So do what you can to get out of that relationship. Now, the last thing I want to discuss just quickly are steps to win-win problem solving because conflict is inevitable, but so is a positive outcome by doing a win-win problem solving. So the, there are seven, there are eight steps to this. And the first one is to identify the problem and your unmet needs. The second step is to make a date with your partner to discuss, a date where you can have uninterrupted focused time on your relationship. The third is to discuss the problem and needs at length. The fourth is to check your partner's understanding of what they feel the problem is. The fifth is to solicit and ask for your partner's needs so that that is clear and out in the open. Then the next step is to check your understanding of your partner's needs. The seventh step is to negotiate a solution. And the final step is to do follow up on the solution. So a lot of good information was discussed here today. I hope you take this information, you use it, you put it into action in your romantic relationships as I wish you nothing but success and happiness and love in your relationships. I'll see you next time at our next lecture. Thank you for listening.